Nearly 40 years ago, Land Rover introduced their toughest, most off-road capable vehicle ever, the Land Rover 90 and Land Rover 110. Now, about a decade later, these vehicles were renamed the Defender, and that's around the same time that it showed up in the United States. Now, two years ago, Land Rover finally brought back the iconic Defender nameplate, and I already had a chance to drive the Defender 110, which is the four-door version. This vehicle, remember, goes head-to-head -head with other SUVs like the Ford Bronco and the iconic Jeep Wrangler. Now, because of its main competitors, we all knew that a two door version of this SUV was coming. And as you can see this week, Land Rover has loaned me the Defender 90, the two door version, which has been shortened by about 17 inches in the wheelbase and in the overall length compared to the four door Defender 110. So if you guys have always been in the market for an off road capable SUV and you crave just two doors, but find the Bronco and the Wrangler to be a little too basic. How does the brand new 2022 Land Rover Defender, Defender 90 stack up? Stay tuned to find out. Now, last year when I got a chance to finally drive the Defender 110, it was one of the most impressive off-road SUVs that I've ever driven. And I'm really happy to see the Defender 90 return to the lineup because if you guys are looking for a two-door vehicle, they are just becoming few and far between. And the beauty about the two-door is you can't even tell it's the smaller version when you're looking at it from the front end. Now, my particular tester I want to point out is technically a 2021 model. It's a Defender 90 in the first edition trim level. You can't buy this trim level anymore for 2022. Land Rover actually already has 2023 models already available to order, but there are no styling changes for the 2022 or 2023 model year. It's just about the trim levels, and 2022 is when Land Rover added the V8. Now, first thing I want to talk about, of course, is the exterior styling of this vehicle. It really continues to stand out, even though this vehicle has been on the market for a couple years. Now, my tester is the first edition painted in Pangea green. Uh, you can see the green color really works well with the lines of this vehicle. This car just has a really tough look to it, especially with the front end, how it spells out Defender in the hood the small Land Rover grille there with the silver line that kind of goes across it. The headlights, which are also very distinctive looking, they kind of have a signature half oval LED daytime running light with LED a low and high beam is an LED turn signal. You have LED fog lights down there in the lower fascia, along with kind of a silver painted area, which kind of tries to look like a skid plate. This vehicle does have actual skid plates underneath. And then you can see the hood with its power bulge here in the center of uh, this really nice texturized diamond plate look uh, on the actual hood, which really, again, gives this vehicle a tough, unique look to it. And I think it looks fantastic, especially in this Pangea green. Now, moving along the side of the vehicle, obviously, this is where we're going to be able to tell this is the two door model. Land Rover essentially chopped 17 inches in the midsection of this vehicle. It still rides on the same D7X platform. It's an all aluminum unibody platform with a four, four wheel independent suspension and air suspension. Uh, this particular one here with the air suspension is jacked up now to the off road setting, which means you have around 11.5 inches of ground clearance. The overall length of this car is around 180 inches long. Its wheelbase is around 102 inches long. It's still about 13 inches longer than a two door Wrangler and about six inches longer than a two door Bronco. So this is still on the bigger end of the segment, but it's a much more manageable size, especially if you plan to go off-roading. Now, speaking of which, if you pl do plan to go off-roading, these are the 20-inch wheels that you get uh, with the off-road tires for an extra 400 bucks. They're wrapped in two 55 with 60 series tires. Um, these wheels are a little bit basic looking to me. I don't like the silver finish. I much prefer like the black or gray finish that Land Rover offers. You can see the fender flares uh, have that black plastic where the vehicle has these bulging fenders around the side here. You can see it spells out Defender, and this looks like a functional vent, but if you look a little bit closer, there's actually nothing that this goes to. So I guess I applaud Land Rover for trying to make it look functional. There's a side mirror indicator here, LED that's black painted, and then the roof panel you can see is white. There's also a nice uh, fabric top sky or panoramic style sunroof with the Safari windows. This makes the vehicle feel a little bit more like a convertible when that roof panel is open. And compared to the 110, you can see uh, the 110 had like a body colored panel here along the side. The 90, as you can see, actually gets rid of it, at least on my tester it does. Uh, I have seen some photos of the 90 with that same panel uh, where you can actually uh, attach like an adventure gear basket to the side of it. That's always been a Defender trademark. You can see along the rear of the vehicle, 
it's still a very, very distinctive look with those four LED uh, tail lights. So it's technically, it's technically four. You have four of these little squares with another small one here. You can see it's an LED turn signal. The spare tire that's a full size matching mounted on the back again gives it a super tough look. Love this the silver accents on the rear bumper. The exhaust tips are kind of hidden underneath the rear bumper. This vehicle also has the tow package. It'll tow a maximum of 8,200 pounds. Uh, and then to access the cargo area, this is where you're going to be making the biggest sacrifice besides the doors. Uh, by going with the 90 version because it's a swing out side style barn or barn door style tailgate. It opens up on the wrong side, at least for the American market, if you guys are gonna be parking this on the street. And the cargo area has been significantly reduced. I mean, this cargo area is pretty useless. You only get around 15.8 cubic feet of space. That cuts it by more than half compared to the two door version. And if you wanna fold down these seats, you actually have to t pull out the seat bottom cushion first to fold this down to get a more flat floor. But when you do that, you get around 58 cubic feet of space. That's a reduction of about 20 cubic feet compared to the four door. So if you actually need to carry some cargo, you don't want to go with the two door model. However, it's just going to be you and your spouse or your or a friend. Uh, you could technically get away with this as long as you fold down the second row of seats and you don't need to carry rear passengers. So let's go ahead and hop into the interior of this Defender 90, the two door version after we talked about the exterior. Let's first show you guys the key fob. This is the typical Jaguar Land Rover key. They do offer a version of the activity key where you can use it as like a watch uh, and you can get it wet. You can leave this key inside the vehicle. I believe Land Rover also has an app where you can access the vehicle, although I've never had a chance to actually try it. Uh, most of these modern vehicles have that feature. Now, the one thing you're going to notice immediately is the fact that now that there's no rear doors here, this front door is a lot bigger and heavier versus the four door model, which is going to take a little bit of getting used to, especially if you're in a tight parking lot. You can see this door swings open very widely and it takes up a lot of space. So keep that in mind. If you guys have a very tight parking area, you can see the door panel has this interesting soft touch material here, which kind of is like a, a fake leather material. It feels very durable. It feels like this can get wet and take a beating pretty well. I also like the exposed rivets and screw heads. Uh, the body colored panel that is showing up on the door. This is also nice and padded with the aluminum door handle. The seats you can see on my tester. Uh, they, I don't particularly love the interior color. It's like black on black on black with a little bit of contrasting white. Uh, they, the seats have a mixture of an interesting kind of fabric material with a rubberized material with a soft text material or like a fake leather material. These are uh, heated seats, which are three, three way heated. You have like a 16 way power adjustable seat uh, with a three person memory on the driver's side, which is nice. It's also actually on the passenger side as well. Wasn't expecting to find memory seats on the driver and the passenger side. You certainly won't find that in a Wrangler or a Bronco along with the ventilated seats are also uh, an option. Now I do have this vehicle jacked up so you can lower this vehicle to help you get in to the car. Sadly, there's no kind of handle here to help somebody who's short like myself get in. So you're essentially going to be jumping into the vehicle or just grabbing the steering wheel to help you get in. But once you get in here, you can see seriously huge commanding view of the road, which is nice. As I shut the door, that heavy door produces a nice solid sounding thunk. And then the other thing I wanted to point out that I forgot to mention, my tester is technically a six seater. It has that bench seat here, which is really rare. You don't typically find this in a lot of modern cars. It does annoyingly get rid of a center console here, but you can see uh, you can actually fit a middle person here. They are going to have a slightly elevated seating position, but you can see Land Rover even gives them a three person harness over there. If you don't want to use this, pull on this strap here, which requires you to use it with two hands. So bear with me while I pull this down. And you can see it kind of gives you a really terrible job of a center console. It's slightly padded here. You have uh, cup holders and a little bit of storage over here. So as you can see, no covered storage uh, and no wireless phone charging pads. So that's a compromise you're gonna have to make by going with the bench seat. Now looking at the rest of this cabin, you can see it's practically identical to the four door version. The button to fire up the engine is right here next to the shifter. And you can hear because of that 48 volt mild hybrid system, it just kind of whirs to life. It doesn't have a traditional starter noise because of the electric starter that basically has replaced the traditional starter. The dashboard you can see has that same kind of interesting faux leather material uh, on this portion where it's actually stitching. This is the same thing over here on the lower portion. Up here on the upper portion, it kind of has a rubberized soft touch injection molded plastic along with the uh, air vents. Uh, it doesn't feel quite as luxurious as other Land Rover products, but it still feels significant significantly more premium than most of the other competitors from Jeep and from Ford. The steering wheel you can see uh, looks pretty nice. It's a big diameter wheel. It is a powered tilt and telescoping wheel. Land Rover and Jag puts the mechanism to adjust it over here on the 
Uh, right side of the vehicle, you can see this power tilt and telescoping wheel. Don't even, ex even expect to find that in its competitors. You have an all digital display here, which again, isn't available on competitors unless you go for a Bronco Raptor. This display is slightly customizable. If I push this panel here, I can actually put the map display in here. I can put your media information. You can also change the way the dials look to be the, a single dial, or you can put an all GPS display. So this is all really nice stuff. You can see there's with the map display, although it's taking a second for it to load up. That looks pretty nice. You have the 11.4 inch Pivi Pro infotainment system. Uh, this is the latest in Land Rover inf Jaguar infotainment system and includes wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. It's a huge improvement over the previous systems. You can see the touch response is pretty snappy and responsive. Love the fact that the CarPlay is wireless. Put the vehicle into reverse. You can see it gives you a full top-down 360 camera with uh, parking sensors, trajectory. It has blind spot monitoring. You can also go into like an off-road mode here, a towing mode if you plan to tow where it will give you a better trailer view. So this is all stuff that you expect. The camera view or the camera quality is also not bad. Going back to the actual uh, Land Rover display here, um, you can see this display works pretty well. And in terms of the navigation, uh, I have to actually end the CarPlay if I want to go into this, the regular navigation. Uh, but you can see the graphics certainly look interesting. You can see there's also plenty of water or off-road modes where you have like a wade sensing. This vehicle will actually ford a maximum of almost three feet of water. So it actually has sensors around the vehicle that'll tell you how deep the water is and it'll tell you when you're getting too deep. You also have that 4 by 4 by 4 i information mode where if it tells you the center diff is locked, which wheel has traction and whatnot. Um, and you also have these uh, tire pressure information stuff. Like this is all really nice stuff and it's about what I expect uh, from a vehicle that wears the Land Rover badge. Here's the Land Rover GPS. You can see it's pretty snappy and responsive, works well. Um, but most people are probably gonna end up using their Apple CarPlay anyways, but it's nice to see that the system itself works pretty well. Not quite as good as what I've seen from the best of Mercedes and BMW and Audi, but still much better than the mainstream offerings. Uh, down here on the center console, you can see you have a shifter that's electronic to control the eight-speed automatic transmission. There's a trigger here on the front. You pull, push that trigger, pull it back to go to drive, push it forward to go to reverse, and then push the P to go into park. You have your dual zone climate control over here, uh, where this dial is kind of like a two, or has two different modes, where if I push in, this is for the seat controls. You can see there's the heated seat. Uh, and if I just switch that, you can see that's for your climate. Push this button here, and this is where you can change your terrain, your drive mode. So there's an eco, a comfort. There's also grass, gravel, snow, mud, ruts, sand, uh, rock crawl, and then there's a wade, and then there's an individual configurable mode. So uh, we'll talk about those drive modes later on during the driving scene. Um, but there is no dedicated sport mode of this vehicle, just a sport mode in the transmission, not in the actual air suspension. You can also raise and lower the air suspension from uh, these buttons over here. Right now it's in its off-road setting. I can see I just pushed that button. You can hear it start to release air from the suspension. It starts to lower the vehicle a little bit, which is definitely cool. Um, down here you can see there are two USB charging ports, a USB-C and a USB-A, an actual power outlet. Uh, there are more charging ports right here. Uh, for the second row passengers. And then you can see good storage along the dashboard, which you kind of need because there's no center console here. And then open this up, you can see the glove box is a bin style, not quite the largest there, but it does work out nicely. Um, the uh, digital rear view mirror camera you can see is great because that is the view out of the back if you don't have it on. Uh, the spare tire and the headrest gets in the way. You can fold that out of the way, but the spare tire still gets in the way. Do it the a digital way and you can see just way more uh, better views. Uh, the seats you can see are also pretty comfortable and supportive. The material is definitely more rugged feeling versus luxurious feeling. And then you can see there are sunglass holders here. This roof panel uh, is like a fabric power retractable roof. So if I push this, you can see the roof slides completely back and it actually will stop midway. And then if you push it again, it'll open up completely. So it's not quite the open top experience of like a Wrangler or a Bronco, but it's pretty darn close, especially when you have both of the windows down, it really gives you that kind of open air feeling that uh, you expect in a vehicle like this. And because the Defender is so wide, you have plenty of interior space for two people and uh, three people to kind of sit across. So uh, this is one of the huge selling factors about the Defender. Now getting into the back seat of the Defender 90 is definitely more of a challenge versus the Defender 110 without those doors. Now to get back here, these are a power seat. Land Rover gives you this little lever that you can pull that'll push the seat, uh, or at least that'll manually tilt the uh, recline forward. And then you push this button here, you can see just push it once, that will start to electrically push the seat forward. Now, 
It does take a little bit of time. A manual mechanism would be much faster, but you can see with the seat basically all the way up, this is the maximum amount of room that you have to get back here. So it's not great. It's actually a little bit on the small side. Uh, Land Rover says you get around 36.6 inches of legroom back here. It's a reduction of about two and a half inches versus the four door. Still usable, but uh, let me get back here and show you guys what it's like. First of all, no handle whatsoever to get into the back seat. So I'm basically left kind of holding on for life as I get into the back seat of this vehicle. But whew, once you're back here, Wow, this is actually not bad once you're back here. This is my first time sitting back here. I'm five foot seven, so um, there is a good amount of legroom back here. There is also some foot space underneath here. And because the roof is so high, you have plenty of headroom, even though, uh, even for taller drivers, there's actually a USB charging port over here. This is probably where you'd have like a connection for a rear seat entertainment system, which this one doesn't have. Materials back here are hard touch plastic. There's definitely a few cheaper plastic back here. I also see some panel fitment gap issues there. My tester might be a really early pre-production model. Somewhat padded over here, which is nice. The Meridian audio system in my tester also, I'm a little disappointed by it. It's a little bit too bass heavy and I heard a couple of rattles when I turned the music up. So that's something to keep in mind. If you guys prefer uh, better music quality, there are rear seat air vents back here with those charging ports, like I mentioned. Uh, the body is so wide that you could fit three people across. I like how the floor is completely flat here, uh, which is nice. Uh, above me, you can see the roof panel lets in a ton of light along with these really cool safari windows. Very unique. You don't find that in any other vehicle in the segment. And then you can see, fold this down, you get an armrest with two cup holders. No heated rear seats back here, but once you get back here, the space is actually pretty usable. And it's probably why the cargo area is so useless because Land Rover decided to keep the space in the backseat passengers usable. However, if you do need to carry people and stuff, the cargo area is practically useless for five people. Underneath the hood of the Defender 90, it's practically identical to the Defender 110, which means you have a choice of three different powertrains. This one here is the middle powertrain that I suspect most owners are gonna go with. Now, just like a lot of other Jaguar Land Rover products, this is the company's new engine, their newest engine. It's a three liter turbocharged direct injection, straight six cylinder engine. It's an inline six with a 48 volt mild hybrid system. So it's technically a mild hybrid. It's an electrified engine. It replaces the starter generator with that electric motor, which helps smooth out the start stop transition of this vehicle. And it adds a little bit more power. It makes 395 horsepower and 406 pound feet of torque. Now this smooth straight six is another reason why you want to choose this over the Ford or the Jeep. It all goes out through an eight speed automatic transmission. I believe it's built by ZF. So it's a smooth automatic four wheel drive with a two speed transfer case and they're active terrain response is going to be standard on every Defender because remember this is their most off-road capable version. Now this is an SUV and even though the two-door is a lot smaller it can still tow the same uh, weight as the four-door around 8,201 pounds so that's very impressive towing capacity and fuel economy is rated at 17 in the city 22 on the highway. That's not really amazing fuel economy but it is better than most of the versions of the Bronco and the Wrangler especially if you go for the Rubicon package or the Sasquatch package. Uh, premium gas is going to be required of course for this straight six. Land Rover says you should get to 60 in about uh, 5.7 seconds. We'll test that out with our 0 to 60 timing equipment. And because the Defender is significantly shorter, the 90 is, this weighs in at around 4,800 pounds, about 200 pounds lighter versus the Defender 110. So last year when I finally got a chance to get behind the wheel of the Defender 110, I was simply blown away. This is an ideal modern a classic interpretation of this nameplate. So we all knew that Land Rover was also going to introduce a two-door version. So now that I'm finally behind the wheel of the Defender 90, it's not technically 90 inches in the wheelbase, but it is about 17 inches shorter in the overall length and in the wheelbase, which is a significant difference. This is still bigger than the two-door Wrangler and the two-door Bronco, um, but uh, this one here has the uh, straight six-cylinder engine. So it's the mid-engine option, which is the powertrain that most people are gonna probably go with uh, if they decide to choose this vehicle. I should be driving the V8 at a later date, but let's go ahead and try out the zero to 60. There's no sport mode, but the transmission's in sport mode. Uh, I'll turn off the start stop for this vehicle and we'll go ahead and brake torque it. <laughs> really silky, smooth straight six. Wow, I just got zero to 60 in 5.5 seconds. That is a smidge quicker than Land Rover's claim. Uh, they claimed about four point or uh, 5.7 seconds. This is about 200 pounds lighter versus the 110. So this vehicle at around 4,800 pounds is still no featherweight, um, but it 
is properly fast. And the straight six, you gotta love the noise it makes. It's a smooth inline six that really enjoys to rev all the way out to 6,600 RPM. Uh, and it's probably the perfect combination for a vehicle like this. I mean, yes, there is a V8 available, which I should be driving later this year, but you don't necessarily need the V8. This, this straight six has just a, a perfect amount of power for the size of this vehicle. And I also like how much smaller it feels uh, from behind the wheel. Let's go ahead and try it one more time. Oh, <laughs> good noise. 5.72 seconds, so yes, this is a quick SUV, and you definitely feel that it's not a sporty SUV. I mean, the, the whole body of this car kind of shimmies around, and it, the suspension's very soft. Uh, there's no sport mode in the uh, air suspension or in the shocks, whatever, but you can basically just push the transmission to either D or S. I had it in S that time. Uh, and it just has a lot of power. It gives you a great commanding view of the road. And the best thing about the 90 for me is the fact that they've shortened the wheelbase and the overall length, but it hasn't affected the ride quality. Uh, my tester has the 20 inch wheels with the off-road tires for like an extra 400 bucks. Uh, definitely worth it on a vehicle like this. And it still has the best ride quality in the business compared to the Bronco and the Wrangler. Now, that isn't really saying much. The Bronco uh, has a much better ride quality than the Wrangler. The Wrangler has live axles, front and rear, and a recirculating ball type steering. That just feels archaic in comparison. But if you're looking for the most refined, luxurious, car-like vehicle, if you want something off-road capable that's you know an, uh, an SUV that's two doors, this is the one you're gonna wanna get. And it will cost you a pretty penny because this car starts roughly uh, 10 to $20,000 more than its competitors at the base end. But you do get a slight discount with the Defender 90 versus the Defender 110. The steering in this vehicle is rack and pinion style, electric. Uh, it is surprisingly good. This vehicle's platform, the D7X platform, is shared with some other Land Rover Jag products. And it's a really great place to, to start. It's got a very stiff platform. You can feel how solid the, the structure feels. I also like how the four-wheel independent suspension gives you that ride quality handling balance. Put your foot down here. The straight six just loves to sing. It's a sweet sounding engine uh, and it really makes this car just feel so potent. Um, you know, there is electrification coming, of course, for Jaguar and Land Rover, but I'm gonna miss this wonderful straight six, which was a new engine a couple of years ago that Land Rover introduced on the Range Rover Sport, I believe, first. But it's just a near perfect partner uh, in this vehicle. Now, the one downside about this car compared to the Jeep and the Bronco is it's not technically a convertible. However, my tester has a feature where I can essentially open up the roof panel here with this power retractable sun sunroof, which is kind of like a fabric fabric style roof. It even will go all the way back. And this essentially lets in some light. It almost doesn't, it doesn't necessarily feel like I'm in a convertible, but open that up. You can hear the engine a little more clearly. <laughs> and you know what? When the roof panel is up, I don't get as much wind buffeting as I thought I would actually. It's still very comfortable in here, even at highway speeds. Uh, the interior stays really quiet, very refined. The engine makes sweet noises. Noises. There's very little wind noise, unlike a Wrangler or a Bronco. So yes, if you're willing to spend the extra money, this will give you the on-road refinement that you're lacking, especially if you are sensitive to NVH, noise, vibration, harshness. This gives you all of that. And it doesn't really sacrifice much in terms of off-road capability. Now, sadly, I will not be able to drive this off-road today because I just don't have it for that long a time. I've been traveling way too much, but on the road, this is where primarily people are gonna spend their time. You can jack up the ground clearance to be around 11 and a half inches, like I mentioned earlier, uh, and it gives this vehicle a seriously commanding view of the road, uh, and you should be able to tackle the same kind of off-road terrain that a Wrangler or a Bronco could do uh, because of that air suspension, because of that shorter wheelbase, uh, and you also get all of the refinement. Now, in terms of uh, seat comfort, they, these seats are an interesting mix of cloth with like a synthetic leather material. They're also heated and ventilated seats, which are kind of nice, or I'm sorry, my, these are just heated seats. You can get ventilated seats, uh, but not on this particular one here. Um, but that's something you can't get on a Wrangler or a Bronco. You can't get ventilated seats. So that's something, again, uh, to keep in mind. The seats, I drove this vehicle for an hour to, uh, and a half on a drive, and it was 
really comfortable. The visibility in here is excellent. You can see out of the front well with this boxy shape. The rear view camera mirror also lets in, or it, it creates a huge view out of the back, or you can also use a traditional mirror if you'd like, but the rear spare tire does kind of get in the way, so I highly recommend using that digital rear view mirror. In terms of the driver assistance, this car does have lane keep assist. It's got adaptive cruise control available. My tester is missing the adaptive cruise option. Uh, this is a technically a first edition 2021 model, but there aren't really any changes for 2022, aside from the fact that the V8 became available. Uh, but overall, uh, in terms of daily driving it, it's comfortable and it's easy to drive. And uh, for fuel economy, in my week's worth of testing, I've been averaging about uh, 17 miles to the gallon in mostly city driving. On the highway, this did about 21 MPG. So it's pretty much bang on with the EPA's targets. So pretty pleased with that. Premium gas, of course, is gonna be recommended. Um, there are versions of the Wrangler that will do better than this, but this is better gas mileage than the Bronco, especially if you guys go for a Bronco with the Sasquatch package. So gas mileage isn't necessarily a primary considering uh, consideration for this vehicle, but because of that electrified hybrid system, that mild hybrid system, this does get pretty decent gas mileage especially when you consider the weight, uh, the aerodynamics, and the performance that this car gives you. So if you guys are in the market for an off-road oriented SUV with a ton of heritage, there has never been a better time to be in the market from the iconic Wrangler to the new Ford Bronco and of course to the new Land Rover Defender. After spending some time with the two-door version of the Defender, I can confidently say that this is still one of my favorite off-road oriented SUVs. However, I personally would go with the Defender 110. Even though in my first review of that vehicle, I said it kind of looked a little awkward from certain angles, this one here definitely looks a lot Lot better on the outside. The compromises on the inside, especially in the cargo area and just getting into the backseat area is kind of a compromise. So unless you don't regularly necessarily need to carry people in the backseat or carry a lot of stuff in the trunk, I would ha happily recommend going with the four-door model instead. The straight six-cylinder engine offers plenty of power. Zero to 60 in 5.5 seconds is stupidly fast for something that doesn't even have the V8. I'm hoping I'll be able to drive the V8, which is a supercharged V8, sometime later this year. The on-road manners of this car is still the best compared to the Bronco, the new Bronco and the Jeep Wrangler. This has the most car-like driving demeanor. It has the, dare I say, sportiest handling dynamics, even though this vehicle is technically not sporty. And the look of this car, I think it looks fantastic. It is kind of a bummer that you can't take the roof panel off or you can't take off the doors. However, with that sliding canvas roof and when you have all the windows down, it sort of gives you that convertible-like feeling, but it's a much easier car to live with because it's just quieter. It feels more solidly rigid it gives you a better highway driving experience. And that's personally why I would choose this vehicle over its competitors. Now, speaking of which, to go with something like the Defender because of the extra security it gives you without the uh, removable panels, this car is gonna cost you more because Land Rover is just technically more of a premium brand versus Ford and Jeep. This vehicle starts at around $47,700 for the base Defender 90 two-door, uh, which has steelies and it has the four-cylinder engine. So it's the P300 trim, four-wheel drive is gonna be standard. That's about three grand less versus the comparably equipped four-door version, but it does make this vehicle about ten dollars to $15,000 more expensive versus a Jeep Wrangler or a Ford Bronco. I'd argue that it's probably worth every penny because uh, this is a Land Rover. It is a more premium off-road oriented brand. My tester here being the first edition model was kind of is kind of comparable to a Defender X Dynamic in the HSE trim. This one starts at around $64,000. The beauty about this first edition model, there aren't really any options to add, although I would probably spec out the silver painted wheels for a black painted wheel. Uh, the off-road tires on my tester for an extra $400. All in, my tester with the destination charge factored in is around $66,500. 66 grand sounds like a lot of money, but I have tested several versions of the Wrangler and the Bronco that are also around $65,000. Now, granted, those are four-door models. Keep in mind, if you want to get this as a four-door, it'll be right around $70,000, which again, is still not that much more expensive versus the Ford uh, and the Jeep. Granted, this vehicle doesn't have the ability to give you that full open air experience, but with its improved road manners, greater refinement, greater luxury, and greater tech features, I'd argue that it's probably worth those small little compromises. But with all that said, I hope you guys have enjoyed my full overview on the 2022 Land Rover Defender 90 two-door. If you're also looking to see the latest cars I'm testing, be sure to follow me on Instagram at redline underscore reviews, like us on Facebook, and as always, guys, please keep subscribing to the Redline Reviews YouTube channel for all the latest reviews. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you all in the next video.